Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks by the New Art School. Our guest today is Alex Salsby. Welcome, Alex. Hey, Lefteris. It's a pleasure, a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's fantastic for you to be here. So tell us about you and your work. Okay. Uh, well, so my... I guess my academic journey in terms of working in in the arts and creativity and education uh, started about 25 years ago uh, when I was a I was a teacher. I, I left the UK, uh, went to go and um, teach art and drama, uh, and got quickly uh, quickly disillusioned with the limitations I felt uh, were so unavoidable. Uh, in in formal education uh, settings. So fast forward sort of 20 plus years after that initial uh, stint of classroom uh, classroom teaching, um, I am now more of a practitioner. Uh, My role title is that of creative director. Uh, So I'm one of the uh, very few people I think who who sit uh, on a senior leadership team uh, within uh, an international school. We are a, a, a four-program IB World School uh, here in in northern Thailand, uh, and I, I had the, the the delightful responsibility and remit for engendering and cultivating creativity across the curriculum, uh, working with our divisional heads and our faculty in order to help support and direct and mentor where necessary to bring lenses of creativity in the arts, not obviously that creativity sits in the arts alone, uh, but to be thinking about creativity as uh, an area of space that needs to happen within within the curriculum, within the teaching and learning uh, that goes on. And fundamentally, the, the primary uh, role that I have, or one of the main remits that I have takes up a lot of the time is uh, managing and directing uh, the program artist residency Thailand, which was set up about a decade ago, uh, with a view to bringing in artists, creative practitioners, and creative thinkers uh, from a broad spectrum of different fields into a formal education environment, and finding ways in which to take the ideas of the practitioner. Uh, the research they were doing, the the books that they were writing or the recipes they were refining, whatever it might be, and to find a way to connect their passion and their creative process to the the teaching and learning that was happening in the school. So finding ways to um, essentially uh, bring together young people, uh, their classroom teacher or or their specialist teacher uh, and a creative practitioner to co-collaborate together and create meaningful um, meaningful experiences for young people that help to diversify uh, the learning that takes place um, in classrooms. Oh, fantastic. Sounds really exciting. So tell, take us a bit back. So tell, how did you start? What, what drove you to start in, in, in education? Um, so f- for me, as a, as a young person myself, uh, it was it was an interesting it was very interesting for me at school i i excelled in in the arts i loved uh music and drama and, and theater and visual arts in fact when i did my a levels in the uk and as levels i did music and theater and art and art history and that was it and i'm not even too sure where you find many colleges where you could where you could be that much of a of a, of a specialist these wow. days and anyway, suffice to say that, 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 that what what are so often uh, wrongly labelled as the core subject areas, if you like, uh, were never really of any interest to me. And I think when I was certainly when I was young in my early teens, I couldn't I couldn't make the personal connection to what I was being told to do and the reason why I had to do it. It was very very much um, a kind of a, a grey area in my head of being not able to get excited about things that I wasn't inherently passionate about. So I think that the seed was planted quite early. When I when I left um, my degree uh, at art school, I, I, I studied fine art. I very quickly found myself back in, uh, back in the education system. 
Doing, doing, doing quite well in that I was a classroom uh, teacher. I then went on to be department head again in, in, in international schools. The students seemingly did very well. They got good grades and so on. But I was still uh, I don't know, disillusioned by the, 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 the structure and the expectation of delivering within a set time frame and so on. And all these things I thought could be changed, could be done better. Um, so that um, led me to... Actually, that led that was the, the the first thing that led me to seek out uh, arts work, which was the Youth Arts Development Agency set up uh, more than quarter of a century ago by the late uh, Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, I went back to the UK, kind of re reparked myself um, in in Britain. Uh, spent a lot of time delivering work within uh, galleries and museums and theatres and cultural centres and also um, spending time uh, working with the team at Artswork to develop at the time what was and what became the English National uh, Youth Arts Network. Um, and that's really where I found my, 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 my passion. I could really start to see how my own experience at school could be reshaped if certain blocks were moved out of the way and certain mechanisms were put in place to allow um, I guess greater greater input into formal education uh, from people who weren't just trained teachers. So uh, people who are coming from different uh, sectors, fundamentally and specifically, obviously uh, artists and uh, creative practitioners. And that um, uh, that work took me into a regular uh, full time role where I was the creative projects and education manager for big theatre and arts complex uh, in the UK called Royal and Durngate. And that's really where I I, I cut my teeth. I, I, I worked with a, a, a massive spectrum of incredibly talented, passionate, professional um, artists, a lot of people who dedicated their lives to the betterment of young people through using the arts in uh, in schools. And I managed three, three big programmes of work, uh, which were by and large focused on 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 working with young people well, there are other components as well but but working with using the arts to transform and connect with disenfranchised young people became um uh, became a big passion and i think that the i think the the fact that all of these amazing arts and cultural centers or whether you're going to the national theater or to tate or to um, um museum of modern art in 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 the us wherever it might be really progressive and impactful uh, arts and cultural centers always had an education department sometimes they call it an outreach department or you know community connection department whatever it might be but there was a dedicated as you'll be well aware there's these dedicated departments and teams who work in the buildings making sure that whatever you're programming whether that's an exhibition whether that's a series of music whether it's um you know what you what you're digging up from an architectural dig and you're putting into a museum or or, or whether it's in the case at Royal and Dungate a lot of the theatre that we produced and presented, it would always have educational work that ran alongside so that you were in a place as an organisation to better connect with young people, create agency, get them excited about their learning, attract teachers in, uh, work with community groups and so on. And um, leaving, leaving that role after seven years, I was given the opportunity uh, to do a consultancy contract for this international school here in Thailand. And the the I guess coming into that role, the thing that it struck me was well, if if great cultural centers, great artistic centers have education departments, they have these outreach departments to help connect um uh, young people and communities to what's happening within a building, why can't we do the same with schools? Why why can't a school that is first and foremost concerned with uh, academics and uh, results and teaching and learning, why why could it not have um, a cultural, a creative and artistic component that sat in the middle and that was fundamentally tasked with 
looking at what was happening within uh, within a division in a school, within a grade level, within a department, um, and finding ways to drive that learning, to diversify that learning, to explore and enrich and infuse that learning uh, via working with external uh, creative practitioners. And that's where the idea was 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 born. And we went from sort of running around at the beginning, uh, connecting to uh, professionals who 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 I knew. Um, and saying, "Hey, would you would you mind coming along and sort of collaborating on this pilot?" And then ten years later, we we receive well, this year we're we're looking towards eight hundred applications for wow. just the, the ten um, uh, sort of component residency blocks that we uh, that we have. So it's growing it's growing exponentially, uh, and we get to work with an incredibly diverse array of um, incredible people and it undoubtedly enriches the the lives of not just the young people who come into contact with the program but also the staff who get to connect to professional development opportunities um, the community who come in and get to listen to or watch or become part of the art that's being uh, created via the people who we are um, collaborating with so it's um yeah, it's kind of snow snowballed from what was essentially. Well, hang on a minute. What if this can sit within the buildings that are connected to our arts and cultural offer? Uh, generally speaking, in a in a cultural context, why can't we flip that model and bring uh, bring those same individuals you would find in those um, cultural offers, but directly into into the educational landscape of of the operating. Of, well, the day-to-day -day operations of a school. Wow. You mentioned you you became disillusioned though with the system. So what 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 happened exactly then? I think I think for me, um, I when I when, when I was teaching, when I was teaching at the time. It was um, uh, a British UK curriculum, so general certificate of education, but in a school that also taught the international baccalaureate. So I think that the I, I started to see that I started to see that teaching and learning when it's not content heavy has far more uh, options for cultivating interest and agency from young people. So I could see that between the GCSE and then going in and teaching uh, the diploma program, but the diploma, I mean, that, that is still standardized. It's still, uh, it, it's still very, very content heavy. Um, and, um, as much as I, I feel that there are, I, I feel that there's a lot to be, how can I say, I, 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 I personally felt as though there was a lot to be gained from doing more of what we were doing in an educational team uh, in an arts and cultural setting in an informal education environment than there was from following standardized curriculum in a formal education yeah. environment yeah. And uh, you you just had you just had far more flexibility uh, you can achieve so much more young people get to sort of take the reins in the direction often of where you're going um, you've got more room for, for for youth voice, and you've also got you've got that beautiful space where you can be free to make mistakes and fail, um, and allow young people to uh, grow grow from those experiences. Where I feel that most of the time in a, in a formal education setting, uh, it's very much about ticking the boxes of of, yeah. of, of of content. It's making sure that your curriculum is covered. And whether or not you're interested in it is is neither here nor there, because that is what pre-prescribed on the packet that you've signed up for uh, as a 16-year-old. And frankly, I don't, at, at, at 16, I don't think anyone should be signing up for for anything that's that rigid. Um, so, yeah, Absolutely. the flexibility. Yeah. And imagine 20 years ago, it was really open-ended. I mean, now it's, it's extremely prescriptive. So, I mean... Used to be very open ended. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't. I mean, the, the the interesting thing about working in the UK was is is more often than not you would be working with schools who would be on special measures. Uh, you would be working with uh, schools that had a disproportionate 
number of disenfranchised people, uh, young, young people within their settings. Um, uh, the, the demographics normally connected in such a manner that you would get the funding to work with a school that needed help. Um, and even even then, we were able to do quite um, quite powerful and progressive things because there was an expectation that in allowing the space for powerful and progressive learning um, to to take place, that you would in turn be helping the schools out the difficult situations and settings that they were that they were quite often in. So I I, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is is that I don't I don't feel personally that. Um, the very, very prescriptive nature of the British national curriculum is anything uh, that I, in my uh, working professional life, have had to really come to terms with. But I'm, I'm, I can, I could pretty much categorically say now that uh, it would not be something that I'm, I would enjoy for sure. Hmm. Fantastic. So, how? Tell us about um, the curriculum and you know, what you're preparing for the for the future. And how do you see as well the role of, of AI that's coming in really rapidly? Uh, mm. how, how that will be affecting things? Okay. Well, I mean, I can talk a little bit about uh, a project that I finished last uh, last week. I mean, it's quite simplistic actually, in the sense that this was um, this was a mural project that we uh, that we that we did. We worked with a mural artist and uh, they came in and they worked with a number of our language acquisition uh, students and they also worked with our uh, English language diploma students and a cross-section of our visual arts students and the I, I tell the story like this because I feel often the idea of bringing in an artist to paint a mural in a school is something that's quite accessible I think a lot of people in uh, uh, in 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 education, working in schools, they can relate to the idea of somebody coming in and working with a team of young people and creating uh, creating a mural. Um, it's a it, it's it's an accessible aesthetic exercise uh, that that people can connect and relate to. But for for me, I I feel that what what we're seeing now, and this will connect to the AI um, question that you posed. What we're seeing now is um, increased marginalization of the arts in schools because fundamentally leadership and often with uh, pressure from government and certainly in, in independent schools, often pressure from parents, they say, well, look, we don't we don't want a workforce that's full of artists. Um, we want a workforce that's full of bankers and engineers and lawyers or whatever else it might be. And um, with that in mind, it's all very nice painting a picture, working with a mural artist, whatever it might be. But this is this is not a career uh, that we value as a society. This is not yeah. a career that I value or I want for my son or my daughter. But the 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 area that is sidelined, marginalised, not understood, not explored, is the fact that in the act of working with a practitioner and creating as part of a team you're developing skills in communication you're developing skills in acquiescence you're developing uh capacity for critical thinking you're having to work in teams and maybe solve issues from a cross-cultural context as much as anything else and then if you then um if you then look at what ai can do and what ai can't do these areas concerning compassion and empathy, uh, uh, creativity, um, um, effective communication, certainly things like acquiescence. Th these are things that the systems that are in place, these, these large um, language models that we're, that we're seeing being uh, developed at a rate of knots, they can touch on some of it. But it's not there yet, and it's not going to be there. That, that fundamental essence of our humanity, what makes us human, sits within those skills that we've, that, that, well, I've just talked and um, touched upon. And also, they're, they're what they are what the World Economic Forum is saying the world needs. It's what UNESCO in the in their latest um, uh, futures of uh, all our futures together. Now I might get the report title wrong, but their future of education yeah. report has come out. Uh, organization for economic and cultural development. Everyone is saying, uh, in a in in a choir like way, 
they're all singing the same thing and uh the, the people in charge of um nurturing and making policy for our education systems seem to be collectively ignoring ignoring the fact and as some people may point towards what universities expect uh in terms of grades and how they need to standardize to assign people to whatever course it is that they might be applying to but i i really feel that the the burgeoning evolution of ai um and and the rate in which it's uh, evolving exponentially uh is without doubt uh a, a case the case is that we need to as schools to almost be pressing reset completely um and, and certainly uh, rethinking our relationship with where the arts uh, sit not just uh, making sure they're not marginalized but pushing heavily to 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 have them centralized in how we deliver uh, the educational um, experiences that we we give young people you mentioned banking has become quite creative lately as well but <laughs> That's another issue. Yes. Uh, um, the thing is, and what I don't, I don't hear enough said is that the way, because AI will, will, will surpass many, many things quite soon, but the way it creates has nothing to do with art and creativity. The way that it, it does design has nothing to do with the design process. So prompting and design thinking or prompting and creativity is something very, very different. And that's what, and I think we have a responsibility as creatives to talk about that, about the difference. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that AI doesn't set about, doesn't set about um, looking at whatever prompt you facilitate with the idea that it's going to make a mistake um, and it will very quickly to the best of its ability in a, in a quite a linear way, um, get to the end result of what it thinks you want to, to see. Whereas uh, creativity, as you well know, is not a, it's not a linear process. Exactly. Um, and, it, and actually to, 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 to digress, I think creativity as it's not a linear process, um, is is another reason why it doesn't fit so easily into into a curriculum because it's not a series of um, boxes to tick or a series of content to 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 digest. So I think that's certainly um, uh, that, that's certainly something that that we need to be aware of. the the other The other thing uh, in terms of the predicted pathway forward, this idea of automation and and how much of how much of access to knowledge and human capacity to access knowledge quickly is going to just become redundant. Um, I think points towards, if anything, one of the predictions that you could make for AI moving into the future is it's going to give us all a lot more free time, I think. Um, and one of the one of the things that I would look towards was what happened during the pandemic where everybody suddenly you had you know around the world everybody was locked down um suddenly we we were forced to kind of come to terms with our own uh with being comfortable in our with with our own company and um there was almost a binary you know some some people went great i'm going to exercise every day i'm going to learn how to play the piano i'm going to write yeah. the novel that i've been meaning to write for however long it's been i'm really going to you know get to grips with baking sourdough bread or whatever it might be. And then another half of the people sat there, they had an existential crisis. They went, well, what's yeah. going on? What's happening to the world? I don't know who, who I am. I, I'm, my, my job, I'm, I'm, I'm going out every day is my purpose. I'm going to sit here and binge watch Netflix and, you know, drink too many bottles of wine. Mm -hmm. um, so if, 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 if AI does predictably give us more free time, moving forward into the future uh whatever uh, timeline we want to give that i think it's it, it it's it's a responsibility now to to give people the tools to do positive 
and meaningful things with their lives as well. So, I mean, that's another area that I think is 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 overlooked because these young people who I I work with, I'm very lucky in that my work can take me into a room full of three year olds, and then I can be jumping into a workshop or an engagement with with a bunch of eighteen year olds. But if I think about these young people who've just come in to the education system at the age of two or three years old and what it's going to be by the time they potentially leave university at 21, 22 years old. Uh, you know, they could be walking around with uh, with with um, models of AI in their pockets, which are going to yeah. be thousands of times more, more well, a certain type of intelligence, but more intelligent yeah. in terms of knowledge acquisition and otherwise than than the average human brain you mentioned though free time but but the, the thing is that bu bureaucrats are creating more and more bureaucracy it's recently you know i what i see in, in in education is that they purposely create more bureaucracy that really doesn't need to be there especially in the past five years it, it's exponential <laughs> so mm. so the, the the mentality of the bureaucrat will always create more unnecessary processes it, it, it's yeah. about the mindset. I think the problem with educational bureaucrats is, is that they tend to be fixated <laughs> with this idea that you can have a one size fits all model for a young person, you know, that, and it just requires more paperwork, more data <laughs> tracking, more mechanisms, more whatever it might be that, and so long as all that's in place, you can more or less get the same outcome at the end of the conveyor belt and and yes. i think you and i would both know that that in reality certainly for an individual with a with a creative mind or an aspiration to use that uh use his or hers creativity it's just simply not true you know um, a, a one size model does not fit all absolutely absolutely so you know it, it's we, we we need to direct these things and make and make a distinction and also what I, I find is that students in the digital area, because they're creating analog experiences, they're quite lost because they have not have had, they have not had the experience in analog. They have not had enough experience in analog. And they're trying to create analog in digital. And, and they're, and they're mm. very confused. Mm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I... I... I remember when I was when I was uh, teaching a well, lot. Last time I had a full time sort of teaching role where I headed up the senior visual arts department uh, in a in a school in Turkey of all places. Mm. And um, at that time, the IB uh, diploma, so the international baccalaureate baccalaureate's diploma level for visual arts, was pretty much like it was like a foundation year at an art school, and you know, your role as the teacher was very much to help nurture and guide young people through the process of exploring an idea that was of interest to them. And you would hold their hands through different processes, whether that would be uh, using clay or making ceramics, carving stone, welding, casting, obviously painting, drawing, so on and so forth. Uh, and I used to. Re I, it was definitely the favorite. It was definitely the favorite part of my job was was working with those young people in that context. And you fast forward now to eighteen years later, and even that element. So the the, the international baccalaureate's uh, course. It now has, has com comparative studies and you have to get online. Nobody comes to see the work anymore. It's just, you know, it's just uploading what you've what you've done into a, um, you know, into a database so that somebody else can look at it on a screen. So you're assessing artwork without actually tangibly and viscerally being able to connect with it in any way. So. So, yeah, I think I, I think that the the, the sort of the analog engagement that is so core to the practice of art making happens still does happen to be clear but it happens in such a it's it, it's it's a much smaller component uh to the to, to the framing of that particular course and in terms of academia my understanding is is that the a you know the a level is is is, is even worse um so 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm being slightly tan being slightly tangential, but the point I would make is is that there does seem to be a trend uh, to towards removing exposure and opportunity to actually uh, create. Uh, and in addition to that, as you say, young people are living in a digital world. You know, they're constantly um, connected in, in in one way or another. So the two things uh, amalgamated together uh, uh, are certainly problematic. Absolutely. So if you had no limitation, uh, anything, would you do anything differently? Would you Would you just do something differently? It, with, with my with my life, with, or in the in, classroom, in education, or, yeah, in, in your education, <laughs> Rocky. Yeah, I, I, well, I mean, I, I had the opportunity to see a lot more project-based learning and a lot more in the way of experiential learning when uh, we worked delivering the projects um, at. Uh, Royal and Dungate, or even you know, I, I did a lot of producing for the National Theatre and their Connections Festivals, and there was a lot of, you know, workshops and um, uh, uh, devising and, and experimenting with young people in workshop settings and so on and so forth. And it didn't have the, the time constraints. So one of the things that I would, if, if it was all up to me, I'd certainly uh, get rid of the idea of a, a formalised um, a uh, timetable where you're pinging a bell after 45 minutes or 90 minutes and moving one, you know, moving a group from one thing into the next thing, into the next thing, into the next thing, which is clearly not how the real world works. Uh, but I think the single greatest, the single greatest thing, uh, well, no, two things, three things if you count getting rid of the timetable. So the second thing would be um, to get rid of this, this, antiquated idea that there's such a thing as core subjects i, I just mm. it just winds me up yeah. um massively because it's just simply not it's simply not true what's core to one person is not core to another person Absolutely. and you and you see that in society and you see that as fundamental to what it is to be a human being um the, the other thing is slightly more contentious but i really believe that meaningful education needs to come from multiple uh inputs uh, and uh, the idea that you're going to learn everything about design or about English or about um, music from one teacher who you're going to meet, maybe if you're lucky, twice a week for 45 minutes is just ridiculous. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's something that really needs to be flipped on its head. I, I, I believe uh, fundamentally in intergenerational learning, the idea that you... Um, you get to learn a lot from people who are coming from different generations. I, I, I've got great friends who are in their um, in their eighties. I've got um, I wouldn't call them friends, but I certainly enjoy the company of my friends' children, who may be you know seven or eight years old, and I learn huge amounts from from all of those people. But I also feel that as well as intergenerational learning, the 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 access to sector specific individuals who are bringing their passion and their expertise to share with young people i mean the the ways in which the voices and the lenses of outside creative practitioners and artists can diversify what would normally happen um in a curriculum in a in a particular uh, unit of inquiry or otherwise is is incredible because because the the the, the, the school where i work Obviously, they are um, using these units on an on an annual basis. You know, so each academic year, you'll cover these different units uh, within the the the, the, the set of PYP in the junior school. Um, and quite often, we will bring in a different practitioner to connect to a different unit. And you see what you see the difference that takes place in the learning and the outcomes based upon the fact that they are working with somebody who's bringing, you know, their toolkits with them. They're bringing their ideas with them that might be different to those of their teachers. And this is not to, for a second, to undermine the incredible work that that our educators do or that formal educators and teachers do. But it is the case that often 
you will, as a, as a teacher, as an educator, depending on what it is you're teaching, you'll bring out the same toolkit. You'll do the same thing. Each year, we're going to explore this thing. So I'm going to go through these you know, sequence of, uh, sequences of exploration of one sort or another. So, yeah, I think diversifying who's delivering the education, diversifying the voices, uh, getting rid of the curriculum and abolishing the idea that you can have uh, this um, notion of there being core subjects that are going to be just as important for each and every single uh, young person uh, would be the three things I would uh, get rid of tomorrow if I could left us for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. How can our viewers and listeners find you? So uh, you can you can look uh, at www.alexsoulsby.com. Uh, you can follow me on uh, Soulsby Alex uh, on X, formerly uh, Twitter, and the program which we have been developing here for the last ten years, whereby we're bringing these voices, these artists, philosophers, um, creative thinkers, and practitioners uh, into this living. Uh, learning ecosystem here in Thailand uh, at Prem Tinsla Non International School. The main program is found at www.artistresidencythailand.com. Brilliant. Brilliant. What advice would you like to leave us with? What advice would I like to leave you with? Um, I, I think, I think, for, I think for 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 me. The, the advice I would say to anyone who is interested in finding ways in which to engender more opportunities for creativity in schools and is doubtlessly finding it difficult um, is that it's incremental dances. It's finding the people in leadership teams and in departments who are interested. And it is about showing them, as we, the, the phrase I often used, uh, is 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 getting them to taste the mango, you know. So rather than the, the 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 the, how can you say the the phrase? It's purely academic. Is there for a reason? You can't just simply explain that this way of working is a great way. You have to show it to people. Uh, it used to be, um, I used to get great advice from. I still do get great advice from uh, Steve Siddell, who used to head up the arts and education faculty at Harvard, and he said every project where there's been even minimal impact from connecting more creative ways or through collaborating with artists that you document it you write about it and you get it out into the public domain you know you 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 start to create a, a more familiar a greater familiarity with the with the narrative of that way of working brilliant well thank you so much for coming uh we'll keep in touch we have a design education forum coming up next year so very exciting stuff. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. A great conversation. Thank you Thank for having you. me. Thank you. Bye.